Megan Hurley, welcome to the show. Megan is head of marketing at Farmer's Fridge. She's been there for over a year and a half. And she's also a founding member of Chief, which if you haven't heard of it, is a private network of women leaders where they're helping and supporting each other. And she's held um, marketing leadership roles at Trunk Club, Pete's Coffee, McCain Foods, and also Whole Foods. And we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm super intrigued by um, your experience in, at all of these different places. Um, Farmer's Fridge was founded in 2013, has around 150 people, and is based out of Chicago, Illinois. We're having some great weather today, so I am yeah. delighted, as I'm sure you are as well. Um, and on the funding side, they have raised Series C, so $42 million total. Um, I'm going to give a quick, I always kind of take this time to give a quick spiel on the company and then how I'm connected a little bit. So I'll do that quickly. Um, so okay. Farmer's Fridge, what is it? it it's um, They're on a mission to make it simple for everyone to eat well. Um, and it's rapidly growing a network of 350 plus user-friendly smart fridges. These fridges that are stocked with chef curated restaurant quality meals and snacks. And a quick backstory. So I worked at the 600 West Chicago building um, and there was uh, Fuda in there and Groupon in there and I used Farmer's Fridge all the time. Um, so delicious and it was super easy, automated vending, fresh ingredients. And I love that like I would go there and sometimes there would be something new. Like they're, you're trying something new, you'd be mixing up with different lunch items. I love that. Um, besides the vending machines, uh, I know that you recently started offering delivery. So that is really cool. And then there's also that partnership with Rick Bayless. This is really cool. There's a lot of exciting things happening for Farmer's Fridge, and I am so happy to have you here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Great, Megan. Well, um, let's jump in. So I talked a bunch and gave a yeah. pitch on the company. What what did I miss? Like, wh why do you exist? Who, who are you for? Like, what's that specific person that wants this? And what are you really trying to solve for them? Um, well, like you said, we're on a mission to make it simple to eat well, but really what that means is making healthy food accessible, easy to find, but also delicious. So um, we started with vending machines and really in places where, you know, there's pain points around getting healthy food. So hospitals, airports, most people know of us from either Groupon or you were or um, O'Hare Airport. That That is a huge um a huge one for us because you're in the airport and you're like, what do I eat? And for me, I used to, when I traveled a lot, it was, you know, a granola bar. Um, and so now you can eat a salad and, and it's, it's super portable. So that is really what we're trying to do is make sure that you have healthy food options where there were none before. Um, and then additionally, it's, it's a healthy food option that you enjoy. So I think that is the, the hardest part. Um, about healthy food is it's just like, oh, I have to eat like that again, um, which is how I sometimes feel about healthy eating. But if you make it delicious, um, then it doesn't feel like such a chore. So that's the other piece of that um, is making it an easy decision um, because the food's good. Yeah. So who, who, wh who's this specific type of person? Because not everybody, some people bring their lunch, right? They used to bring their lunch to yeah. work. Some people would go out to eat. They really needed to like get away from their desk. So like, who is this person that absolutely loves you and is like the super fan, super user? Yeah. So what's interesting is when I started here, we didn't really talk about your typical like marketing persona. It was more about like we serve everyone, which is great, but all marketers cringe at that. You're like, if you're serving everyone, then you're serving no one. Um, and so we've done, especially with delivery, like what we found is that the biggest thing that we're solving for, for humans without taking away, you know, without diving into a persona is convenience. And then the second piece of that is health. So convenient first, like there, anybody who's eating our food is like, I need to eat. Like I didn't plan. I didn't, I'm hungry and I need to eat. And they're going to eat either the granola bar, like I was mentioning, or if we're an option, they're going to eat, eat um, farmer's fridge. And so, and 
And then there's a group of people that really health is important. And so it is, it is, um, you know, the convenience decision. And then if they're able to eat healthy, that will be the second, you know, biggest factor in their, their decision-making process. And what we're finding, especially with the pandemic is so many of our um, customers are really, you know, people that are strapped for time and home. So it happens to be a lot of parents, um, a lot of, you know, you're homeschooling your kids. You're also working from home. Your partner's also working from home. You have no time though. You're sitting in your kitchen all the time. Um, and so farmer's fridge is that salt for you. You just open it. We, we've had feedback where someone was like, I put it in my calendar to walk to the fridge, pull out a farmer's fridge jar and eat my salad. And it takes no time. And you're like, and that's the life I live too, you know? So, um, so it's really those time pressed people. And we're starting to find more, um, you know, it's that typical urban professional, obviously driven a little bit more by women. Um, but really not, not as much, not as high as you would think, um, but yeah, so we're diving into personas right now. Okay, awesome. Thank you for, for talking through that. That's really fascinating for me and also makes sense given our current lives and situations. <laughs> um, it's funny that they put that in their calendar. Like I'm gonna walk to my fridge now and take that salad out and eat it. And yeah, that's it. And a, I, it was a reminder for her and her husband. And I was like, to eat, like, we need to go eat. And I'm, I'm sure that was, I feel like in my house, it would have been driven by some like random hangry fight that we all had at like 3 p.m. And it's like, you need to schedule your meals or else, you know, things aren't, aren't going to go well. But to totally, yeah. totally. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, where are you, lo like, where are you available? So we just actually expanded um, in the Midwest and Northeast. So we're now um, in basically across all of the states. So from Ohio to, we actually have a, a fascinating cluster of customers in Vermont that I am like currently obsessed with. Um, but we just started um, serving the St. Louis area up through Michigan and Wisconsin. So just launched that expansion this week um, for our delivery program. Um, for retail, we're at Targets and um, soon to be another retailer in Chicago. And then in New York, we're at uh, Gristidi's and Diagostino's. And then additionally in New York or New Jersey and Chicago, we're at Dunkin' Donuts. So. Wow. That's so, that's in addition really cool. to all of our fridges. Yeah. And our favorite fridges. So the, the Dunkin' Donuts uh, and opening up there, what was the thinking since you mentioned it, what was the idea there? Yeah. Because Dunkin' Donuts, um, I wouldn't think to put like a vending machine with healthy food in the Dunkin' Donuts. Yes. So it's not our vending machine. It's just our food product. Um, but also like the same thing, like selling salads through um, a Dunkin' Donuts sounds a little um, different. So we, what they have is three of our salads and then three of our bowls. So like they have our yogurt parfait and our oats. And I actually took my sons through the line and I'm like, oh, they're going to be so excited. I'm going to get, they're going to get Dunkin' Donuts or drive through. And they ordered farmer's fridge. And I was just like, but proud, but also disappointed. I was like, this was supposed to be the best surprise for you guys. And you ordered a yogurt parfait from Farmer's Fridge, which, you know, I have plenty of. So, um, but yeah, so they have six of our items now. And it was really about them offering um, that ready, you know, that grab and go item to their customers. There's been, and, and obviously pandemic driven, this uptick in drive through and people wanting like the one stop grab all my stuff. Um, you know, there's, because of everything that's so limiting. Um, and so that was really, it was driven by that behavior. That makes sense. Thanks um, for explaining that. Um, what does your marketing team look like now? Um, anything different in the way that you're structured? Yeah, so um, we have three main areas. We've got a, a fantastic creative team that's driving um, all, the, all of the fun stuff you see out in the public. Um, we have a, a brand team that's just been hustling our brand, but also in addition to that, trying to figure out all these partnerships with retailers. Um, and then we have a growth team that is probably our newest. It's our little baby team um, that really was born out of the pandemic. I think before then it was really just focused on digital, like your traditional email marketing. Um, but now that we have really moved into direct to, direct to consumer, um, you know, they've taken on all those paid media channels that we uh, weren't participating in prior to uh, 2020. Um, and then really w working on, you know, all the traditional email and web web things. So it's those three pillars um, that we really focus on. And then 
um, have grown those teams. We actually doubled the size of our team with the pandemic, which went from like four to eight, but it was still, <laughs> still exciting. That's big. When you double a team, yeah. even if it's from a small size, that's that's really cool to hear that. Yeah. Um, means you guys are doing well and growing, so that's yeah. exciting. Um, so let's dive into your marketing and what you're actually sure. working on there. What has been working well for you? You mentioned your team and how you just started out this like um, small growth team that's more focused yeah. on paid media. What's been really working well for you? Like what channels are doing really well? Um, so we have and, and historically have done really well in PR. Um, people are interested in our stories. I think the Duncan one, I mean, we got a lot of national press on that one. I think just because it was such a unique little wacky partnership that came out, people were like donuts and salads. Um, and so that I think has been the biggest and, and one of the biggest opportunities for my, my career. I've worked for really great brands and never have had the luck um, with PR and I don't want to say luck because we do have an amazing um, PR partners that work really hard on our behalf, but um, we have a fun story and we have a fun founder. Um, and so we PR is good for us. Um, the more, you know, the, the tactics that we really hold on our team um, that have really grown just in the past year is obviously paid media with most of it being Facebook. Um, it's like the, you know, the, Achilles heel, it, it does so well for us, but then also it's Facebook, so you don't want to rely on it too much. Um, but we've really found success with customer acquisition on Facebook, which has been been great to see um, for our direct to consumer business. Um, and then email is just, I love our email program. Obviously I'm partial, but I just think our our copy lands well. It's fun. It's not, you know, too doesn't it, we really don't want to make eating healthy complicated. Like I, we don't want to act like this wellness too good for you kind of vibe. We just want to be accessible. It's just like, this could be fun. Um, and I think we're really nailing that with email and it's, and it's proving that with just our, our performance metrics I've just been really skyrocketing. I would love to dive into PR. I think, yeah. um, a lot of company, a lot of startups, um, just that they're not quite sure how to tackle this beast because on the yeah. one hand you want to get the word out there and maybe pay a little bit of money to get on some like in a news story and but on the other hand it's a beast like how do you actually make it work for a startup that doesn't necessarily necessarily have a lot of money to spend on this but still make it work um yeah. what do you start like do you start you have to have something to to, to tell, right? You have to have a story, but then what, yeah. what next? Like, what did you do to make it effective? Um, so we, our partners are, are great. And I, this is the first time I've ever been in a marketing role where we didn't use a very traditional PR agency um, and not to knock PR agencies at all, but they are stuck in a certain framework. Whereas when you work with a, a smaller team or a consultant, like they can kind of go where the water runs, which is really helpful when you're, in a startup mode because you could kind of tell the startup story or you can tell the, um, you know, whatever your product story is, there's just a lot there. Um, and they can kind of go anywhere because they're a generalist versus saying like, we are the PR agency that will get you that one big hit. And so that's been really successful and helpful. If I were going to recommend anything to like founders, I think if they can tell their founder story well enough to get funding, then you can do PR well. And I, PR personally, I, not, I don't like doing PR. <laughs> it freaks me out. I think like the managing of it is out of all the marketing things is the one there. I would be like, I never wanted to be a PR professional um, or crisis management, like keeps me up at night. And so just the idea of that stuff is not my wheelhouse, but if you pitched your business and you got people to believe in you, that's the same story that consumers want to hear um, or, you know, people that also want to start up their businesses. And so that's kind of, it isn't a manufactured thing. It's not the same as like an integrated marketing campaign where you're really trying to come up with a message. It's just more of like trying to figure out where your story is fitting with the current, um, like the current environment, I guess. Yeah. So it sounds like you worked with a small agency and you had a, a story to tell, right? With the Dunkin' Donuts partnership. So is it just like, did they find the smaller um, places, like smaller, um, like uh, 
uh, places where people read different articles and maybe more digital focus, right? And then just go after a bunch of those. Yeah. Um, Really, I would say our partners have really good relationships. And so they just have ongoing relationships and can say like, here's a fun story we have. And then that gains steam. Um, and, And I'm so thankful for it. But I would say it's a little bit more about working with people who have long standing relationships and people are really interested in telling the story. Cause there's the other side of PR where it's like, I paid for this placement and that can get really expensive. Um, it also, I think consumers can tell sometimes where it's fabricated or there's the even other part where you're paying this giant thing for a marketing campaign and PR is the agency is part of just promoting that campaign versus you being a thread within a story that's happening in, in your environment. Um, And so that's where it's just, it's about working with agencies or partners that have really great relationships are really in the media environment, um, which has really benefited us. And I've had success in the other ways in past companies, but they've been at a different point in their growth. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Thanks for diving in a little bit deeper on that one. I'd also like to ask you about paid social. So with Facebook, What's um, what's something that like you've been doing um, maybe with uh, the, the, the creative or the copy or like testing or anything that's gotten you to a place where you feel really good about it? Yeah, so um, it's so funny because in the, I mean, we still kind of do this. It's almost like I don't want to like, <laughs> like expose us, um, but so much of our photography. So now we work with photographers, but in the beginning when we really launched on Facebook, like you can see, like I can identify all the hands and kitchens because they were all of ours and we were doing iPhone photos or iPhone videos. Um, my husband has a really top performing ad um, creative that he's very proud of. He was just in it. It's just his like body um, dumping a salad, but he's very proud. And, and that was really what happened. Like our team um, really did, I'm going to say gut check, but you know, gut checks are informed by all of these different signals. Cause you're in the marketing every day. Um, they, we were home and we didn't know what to do and we had to launch this channel. And so we did a lot of, um, obviously we're well aware of what's happening on paid and, and in social, and we're really deep into those worlds. And so we did, we took cues like motion, people like motion, people like colors, um, and really did that on our own. Um, and then from that, just started to see what was top performing. So we saw that um, you know, UGC, we actually have um, uh, an ad we call Tomato Fridge because we had UGC of someone posting like, hey, I'm so happy. Here's Farmer's Fridge in my, in my fridge. And they had tomatoes in it. And the amount of people that were like, you don't refrigerate tomatoes. Um, you should know better Farmer's Fridge. And I was like, this is, this is a human's fridge. Like, I get it. You shouldn't refrigerate tomatoes. Um, but it performed so well because it was real like it looked real it was real um and i think people recognized that um need for their own fridge you know like it was kind of like look at this how easy it is and all the things this this person has stocked in there and so once we started to see what was performing well we started to create more um um, of our own images in, in that way and then we also try to be really creative and, and test a bunch of different stuff. So there's there's things that we really love that completely bomb. Um, we just did one with, a, it was like our burrito bowl and it was something we did with the guacamole and we were all like, this is so beautiful. And the consumers do not think it was fun. So, you know, we try, we put in a testing structure within Facebook to let creative kind of run and play against our top performing creative um, or before we put it against our top performing creative. And really, there's a definitely a testing strategy to all, all of our creative, but especially the new, like if we're testing like a new format or a new kind of look. Um, and so it's been, it's, it's a new muscle for us, um, but it's been going really well. And we've now outsourced our photography and we actually aren't organized enough that we're doing it monthly, monthly kickoffs and we have a whole plan together. It's, it's great. That's so exciting. I have to say that that's how we started at FUDA because we also were very food focused and yep. we just had our internal team. Somebody had a nice, nice camera. They brought it in. Yep. 
He was actually like um, a developer. He brought it in, but he had like another skill on the side. And we would just, you know, put some food, organize it. I would kind of manage it, make it look nice. Yep. It was like my first foray into being working with food for photography yep. purposes. And that's how it all started. And I think you kind of have to do that when you're a startup and you're being scrappy. You just gather your your food and your iPhone and creative yes. ideas and just start doing it and start testing. And that's what I love about startups and also the B2C environment. This is how you succeed in social. Yes. This is like, this is how you do it. You have to just kind of be scrappy and think about like, we're all people out there. What's going to be enticing, interesting, entertaining, like put some creativity into it. Yeah. And, and, and see what works. So I, think I love fun. I think that's the other thing is like, you can get so, um, especially marketing lately can get so deep down into the analytics that you forget you're analyzing a human and human behavior. Um, and we're all humans and we can be very fickle. Um, and so it's like looking at the numbers, but also paying attention to like, they may not like that because of the way the hand looks like the hand came in at the wrong angle or something. And everyone's like, look at that freaky large hand, you know, like that. Cause that is how humans behave. And then they don't want, they're just like, that's some weird stuff they just put out and I'm not going to click on that ad. So, um, because that's true. And that won't, you won't see that in the numbers, but you will see that in the comments like tomato fridge. Absolutely. Um, I love that. And I do use that as well, where yes, you got to if you if you're looking at the numbers, it will tell you part of the story. Yeah. But sometimes you need the, to use the small data, look at the comments, see what's engaging, what are people actually yeah. saying? Is it from the right people that you're really targeting? Right. And then from there, you can actually attribute like, okay, that was a pretty successful campaign or yeah. not. Um, so interesting. Okay, what can I ask you about? I'm just intrigued because we talked about PR, we talked about um, paid ads. What about email marketing? Um, and I have said this before, maybe to myself, <laughs> maybe to others, but <laughs> email is not dead. If you know how to, it is alive and thriving. If you know how, what you're doing, if you're talking to your target audience in the right ways and you're engaging, they will open and they will click. So what um, specifically are you doing an email that's working well? Um, I love our email program. I am a like email is dead, but maybe not. I'm a recovering person of email is dead. Um, I, I love email in general. I think email is actually getting a lot better because people are realizing they need to put content in it. Whereas before it was just like click to this thing. And, and it was, it was just seems so clickbait, which it is now, but I feel like because of all these newsletters or there's just a lot, I get, a, I now read my emails, which I, I mean, work emails, I always read to whoever's listening to this, but my personal emails are emails that I get where I will get information in that email and I will read that. And I think that was not how email was in years before. It never actually gave me content. It made me go to a page to get content. Um, Ours aren't content heavy, but they're enjoyable. And I think that I, I feel like we're really nailing our tone and we're not taking ourselves too seriously. And I think that's what people expect of us. I think that's what people expect of a Midwest food company. And, you know, like, like Chicagoans don't, we're not, we just don't take ourselves. We're just pragmatic and we're, we recognize that, you know, we kind of lead, lead a little bit more, you know, we're, we're just more regular. I don't mean that in an insulting way, um, but I think we can take ourselves a little less seriously in the Midwest. And so as a salad company, um, I don't want to sell. I don't want to make it hard and I don't want to make it feel like you don't, you shouldn't eat this food. I want it to be like, we're all in it together. And so I feel like our emails do a really good job of having fun. And, and sometimes like we probably have too much fun with them. Like we just did a, when we launched our, um, our 14 state expansion, we, you know, made a joke about your mother-in-law in St. Louis, which is our founder's mother-in-law in St. Louis. <laughs> and so like to us, that's like an inside joke that we all think is very funny, but also is relevant. Like I have a whole bunch of friends I went to school with that haven't been able to support my, you know, my work because I live in St. Louis um, or wherever. And so I think that 
that's really what's been working for us in email is we see it as a, it is definitely a driver of revenue and it, you know, we really do want people to click and do certain behaviors out of it. But instead of driving towards that click, it's like how, what's the human experience of this? And like, can you be funny? Can you test some things? Can you just be a little bit more relatable versus like button here, button here, button here, button here. Um, and that's, that I think is my team really being, brave about testing things. Um, and then that's just really understanding right now, we are doing a good job of understanding how people want to engage with us. Yeah, I really love that you said like, what's the human experience? I, I think bringing that in once you you and your team have been bringing that in, in across all of your marketing channel, that yeah. that human experience, like what is the expectation of this food company? And the expectation is like, to have a personality, yeah. to be real, to talk yeah. about mother. So thanks for diving in to um, more than one channel that's working well for you. Um, I sometimes just like to go off on a tangent and, and dive deeper if something sounds interesting. And yeah. it really does sound like you you guys are um, trying things out, exploring, testing, um, being more human. And that's why I love talking to B2C companies. We gotta, we gotta do that. Um, what about challenges? Like what's, what's some stuff that's really, you mentioned like PR kind of being a little bit nervous yeah. about that, but what are you trying to figure out these days? Um, I mean, I think there's the general challenge of like, where is the world going? And I think we all sit in that swamp about life and, and work in general. So like where every day I can analyze, like, are we going to get healthier? Are we going to get to go outside? You know, like all that. So that I think is a challenge is like trying to figure that out, but also telling myself to like not figure it out. Like no one has that figured out. So like, don't worry about it. Um, the other thing that is a new challenge for me in my career um, that I haven't dealt with before is like trying to figure out how to grow a team that supports the growth of the organization. And that is very hard. And it's, been really hard to find people that can that understand what I'm talking about or have ever done it before. And so I have a vision of what I want the team to be, but there's this like weird split of you need general people with also specialist qualities. Because if you look at so like let's talk our growth team. When we hired the leader of that team, she was coming into digital marketing for fridges. And then the pandemic hit in the middle of her interview process. And I was like, oh, by the way, we're on Facebook and it's <laughs> direct to consumer and I've been doing it and I don't want to do And here you go. Um, and so she had a lot of very technical, you know, specialized skill, but she was general enough to be like, okay, different challenge. Let's go do that. And, and that one, that person is hard to find, but also that how do you build a team that's not a whole bunch of generalists that all want to do each other's job or can do each other's job and are specialized in enough things. It's just that balance. And then also in a year, what do we need? Cause you don't want to get caught on your back, you know, on your back feet. Is that the, whatever the, whatever the term is, you don't want to be caught like hanging back when you really should, you don't want to say like, I should have hired someone to do web three months ago. I should have hired like, that's, I think, I wouldn't say it keeps me up at night, but it is a thing I think about constantly is how, is my team supported? Are they supported for the next six months? Are we set up right to succeed? And I think about that often and I've not found many people that can explain either how they did it or many people that have done it. And that's the hardest part I think for startups in general, not just in marketing. Yeah, hiring at a startup is definitely um, a, a challenge for sure because you're looking for that person that like also can just change things at the drop of a dime, right? And be yeah. ready for something that's completely opposite of what they were doing before. I, I think it takes a certain kind of person. And I also <laughs> think being scrappy and figuring stuff out as you go and being okay with not knowing all the answers, like it just takes a, a certain kind of person. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to say was, um, was a lot of times startups for their, they think, okay, we're ready to grow marketing. And then they, they, they bring one person on. Um, what do you think about the idea of like, no, when you're ready to grow marketing, you need to bring on like four people yeah. at once because 
you're not going to move as fast, get as far with the one person you need to like automatically bring four people on. Like what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, I think if you're investing in one person then you're not really investing in marketing, you don't, you're testing whether you think you should care about it or not. Like I just, one person can't get the work done. Um, whether that person's super tactical, then you have nobody driving strategy. If that person's super strategic, then you have no one help them with tactics. Um, a good amount of my team could kind of flow between both strategy and tactics, but they need to do, like, they need to do one or the other. Like, it's not about, can this person do everything? It's like, where do you want their brain to be spent? And so when you're starting a marketing team, at least two people, like you just need a team. You, it can't just be one person. Um, because also marketing is super collaborative and it's about coming up with ideas. It's about solving the human experience, uh, taking away pain points. And you can't do that talking yourself. Um, and if you're bringing on a marketer, you probably don't have an insights team. You probably don't have a marketing analytics team. You probably don't have all the things that would also help to inform those. And so having just a larger marketing team, they can navigate um, enough of the road to be able to figure it out. Um, but it just, it is a team effort. Uh, and I, you know, I feel like the most I learned about working in marketing, I learned in working team sports. And so it's just, it really is a team effort and investing, actually investing in it versus like this weird test of one human. I've just not seen that work out well. And I think it looks really lonely mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. That's just painting <laughs> such a bleak picture there. Yeah. Um, so for these people, and I'm just curious, like for these, you talked about you want to have enough of that generalist, yeah. but also specialist qualities in these people. Who are these people? Like, who are the people on your growth team? You, pr yeah. Probably the, you know, person that's, um, that understands paid ads, but like, wh yeah. who who's on that team? Um, so like people who, so we have the head of growth and she tactically can do everything. Um, so, which is great. And I like tactically did a lot before she started or with her. That's also um, key, right? Like the yeah. fact that before this person started, you did, you did all of the execution yeah. stuff. Yeah. And at the same time, having to say like, this is what I think we need to do and then be the one to do that. And like, I wasn't super strong at buying Facebook ads. I've done it. Um, but it's scary. And so being, Kind of just like knowing you have the support of your leadership to test things i think is really important um and test and fail and or test and learn um but so she you know has a digital marketing background and really has gotten into the weeds on a lot of these things so then she can solve her way out of like we shouldn't only be on facebook what are the other options um and then underneath that role is um positions actually that we're just hiring for right now. So there's a life cycle person. Um, we weren't ready for life cycle before we were using MailChimp, which is great. Um, but you can't do segmentation out of that. We just launched, you know, the ability to do SMS and push. And so now that we're in a new email service provider, and we have these other things, we truly need a, someone to come in and help us navigate it. Now before it was my brand, or currently it's my head of brand and head of growth that do all the email. Um, and, and go in there tactically and will do their own sends and segment everything on their own. And it's just, it's going to bust eventually because it's a lot of work. And so that's why we're hiring someone to come in and really help with the tactics of life cycle. Um, and so then in the next position, you know, we're looking to hire is, is web to support SEO and CRO and SEO. I feel like, I mean, it's a drag of a, of a daily task, but I have in my career seen SEO be by far one of the, the bright spots of performance. And so I'm really excited to start investing in that as we kind of really update our, our web presence. But we didn't have a really a website that we were able to adjust. We are about to get one. And so now that investment makes sense. Awesome, thank you for, for diving into that. Um, I'd love to talk about you. Yeah. Your career, you have worked at some fantastic places. You've worked yeah. inside the store, so Starbucks yeah. and Whole Foods. Yeah. And then you've worked at co in corporate like McCain and Pete's and Trunk Club. So that creates a very interesting Megan. Like how yeah. has that <laughs> impacted the way that you do brand and growth now yeah. at Farmer's Fridge? Um, so I think... 
So in Starbucks, I was in operations and Whole Foods was the first time I had actually worked in marketing. And I think what it did is two things that I find really valuable in, in my job now. One, I understand operations. Um, so I understand the day to day black and white decisions that an operator needs to make to impact their p &L. And so sometimes when a marketer comes in with a big idea or some fantasy, it's just like, you don't understand anything. And it's like, no, no, they just have a different job. But I, I understand how that could be misunderstood now that I've worked operations where I'm like, you've been up at 4 a.m. because the alarm went off and nobody delivered milk. And then he comes in and is like, we're in the milk pain. And you're like, you don't understand my life. So that's been really helpful. Um, the other piece of it is the day-to-day -day interactions with consumers. And so um, Starbucks actually was really great at training me in that space, but also Whole Foods. So at Whole Foods, when I, I had, was on the marketing team the entire time I was there, but part of it, like you mentioned, was in the stores, and then I moved into their corporate offices. When you're in a store in a Whole Foods, I don't know if they do this anymore, but they did when I was there, um, you had to face the shelves at 2 p.m. every day, no matter who you were. Like, if you were not helping a customer, your job was to go down and face the shelf. So even as like a associate coordinator, when I was in the back in the stores at two o'clock, you face the shelves. And what you find when you're facing the shelves, which just means pulling two cans forward and making everything look beautiful. You talk to customers and you see them looking at stuff and you see them stopping um, and staring and you observe so much about consumer behavior um, and you also have to work during the holidays. So like one of the things we really found out, I worked during Thanksgiving and like people are super freaked out about making turkeys. Like it was my favorite time to work. I loved it. Cause people were like so nervous and scared about a turkey. And really turkey is not that good. Like it's just like the bigger the turkey, the worse it tastes, just put some butter on it and call it a day. It's not gonna be bad. And out of that though, came this huge insight of like really the star of Thanksgiving is sides. And so the next year when we went into planning, like we did an entire campaign around sides. Like everybody likes sides. No one's like my favorite thing at Thanksgiving dinner is turkey. Like everyone's like, it's that broth casserole or whatever it is. You know, like that's the thing most people are talking about. And so we did a whole campaign about that that really was unlocked by the insights of just being on the floor and recognizing this behavior that no one's going to tell you that in an, in an insight survey Consumers don't actually know how to verbalize sometimes their concerns. But if in a day you're working the meat counter and 35 people are like, what do I do? And is there something inside this turkey I need to take out? Cause I read somewhere, like you start to realize that that, it, that is a real threat. And so those were the two big things. It's like the understanding my partners better and understanding that you really need to talk to consumers to understand what, what their pain points are and what their issues are. Yeah. And sometimes look at them from afar. That is so interesting. And I would almost like, like to jump back to the days where, um, I actually, my first job, I was in high school, I worked at Walgreens. So I totally understand like the facing the shelves. We would not be yeah. facing the shelves at 2 PM. We would be doing it after the store closed, which is probably not great, but I was <laughs> young at that time. So I'm sure that they yeah. changed their methods, but, um, that's so I would love to just go back and and do that and kind of like spy on what's everyone looking at? What's everyone confused about? What are the questions you're, you're they come up to you and ask about? That's where the insights come. And then you get your ideas for marketing. So I love that. Um, yeah. If anybody like if you guys are shopping farmer's fridge at Target and anyone's creeping on you, like I'm probably on the marketing team at farmer's fridge because like we've all been creeping on the behavior and watching what people do and how they pick up our product and how they engage. Um, it's really unlocked a lot of ideas for us. So, so apologies awesome. to anybody that feels stalked, but <laughs> it's helping us with our marketing plan. That's right. It's all for the good of everybody involved. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would you say are some, you've been involved in marketing and um, growing brands for a while. Like what would you say are some bad recommendations in your area of expertise in marketing, in growth? Um, I think, so the pendulum swing of obsession with one part of marketing has just always fascinated me and also, also probably made me really mad. So right now, I think we're way far over, or maybe coming back, but analytics and paid media and this growth of DTC brands. 
And this growth of DTC brands that are going public, and then you see how much they acquired a customer for, and they can't build retention. And it's, they can't build retention probably because they never built a brand in the first place. Um, they didn't build, they didn't drive a, and maybe they are solving a pain point, but they never developed demand for their product or a consumer that's excited about their product. They built someone to click and buy. And so there was this like, you know, back in the day where you couldn't measure marketing that well. And it was over here and we're like, oh, here's marketing. I think it's doing well. And then the swing to, we only do marketing that's measurable, directly measurable. And where I'm hoping we come back to is right in the middle where we really like, we are marketing towards humans. They, you know, they don't want the aggression of a click and they're not going to be that loyal to a company where they just bought one item, maybe, but overall that's not really how you develop a loyal consumer and kind of this coming right in the middle and being just a little more general and a little more customer funnel um, across a full funnel and understanding that there are some things you're gonna do that are measurable, but not measurable immediately in the same way Facebook is. And that's okay. And so building a program that really shows over time the right investments in the consumer journey, I think are most important and I don't, see many people having that conversation. But I've seen companies and companies I've been part of that invested too far one way or too far in the other way and struggled. Um, and so it's like just a normal approach to consumer behavior. We already know all of that stuff. Why do we continue to forget it? Um, and so that's the worst advice is when people are like, only pay, put all your money in Facebook or only focus on this part or only focus on this part. And I just, I think it is, um, I just think it's a mistake. It's proving out in the in the world um, that the focus on one tactic just doesn't make a strong consumer or customer base. I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I also think that it's so strange how we swing from one side to the other side. Like, why can't we just be yeah. balanced? That's. I think that's what you meant when you said we're Midwest, we're Chicagoans. Like, we we're all about that. Just you know human being human about it we're very pragmatic i think it's we're also balanced and yes. and i think that that's the right yes. approach to take with your marketing is to be balanced and like don't swing w one way just because that's like everyone's getting on that wagon and talking about it more maybe you're reading about yes. it more and then you like completely steer your team in that direction um meanwhile like you said human behavior hasn't changed so um I'd why yeah, and like i i mean i think chicago actually for a lot of things like there's a joke about you know midwesterners and how they go into places and they're like hi oh you know like they play the who do you know game from chicago like it happens in arizona like all the pockets of chicagoans right but that's true like we really there's an obsession with connection to other humans that is really driven out of the midwest that you don't see so much on the coast and and like that isn't um, a bad or good thing. It's just something that has been helpful um, to when I'm talking about marketing is I truly want to figure out how to connect with someone and make them feel welcome. And it does seem to be a trait that is driven out of, out of my city. Well, I'm happy that we're both here together and we agree <laughs> on that. <laughs> Maybe we're a little biased, but who cares? I'm can... so biased. I'm so biased, <laughs> but like Chicago all day, every day. That's right. That's right. Um, let's talk about, um, Failure, failure, yes. because, you know, in marketing and as we are experimenters for life, we, we can experiment, we can try things out, we can fail, we can try something else, we can succeed. So what, where is like a failure you've had or like mistake you've made that have really shaped you as a person or have shaped, has shaped how you lead? Um, I mean, I think the one example of getting obsessed with like numbers has, has, has bitten me. So the wanting so hard like other teams to show like we did we paid for this and it delivered this and knowing now in my career that that's not the right way so that's one place but really the most is like i don't i can be a very it's been mostly management so i can be very direct and i don't take time to celebrate and it's it constantly comes back and it's like well yeah i know we did that good let's go talk about like what we did wrong um, and that I think is not good in managing the team, but also like just not good in, in general. Like I think 
honestly, I think you learn a lot from what you did well and you can apply that to other marketing campaigns versus like trying to fix, like sometimes it's just like, well, we didn't do that. You don't have to be, I think the thing is you don't have to be the best at everything. You just have to be the best at the, at a few things. And so if we did something really well, like let's celebrate it and figure that out versus the obsession with like perfectionism or, uh, you know, solving everything. And so that was feedback that I got as a manager, um, as a first time manager back in my twenties, but also as something I think is good marketing. Like you, you don't have to be on uh, like clubhouse. Like you don't have to be on clubhouse. It's okay. Like it is okay to not be on every single platform all the time. Just do what you do really well um, and don't spread yourself too thin. And so I think that has like celebrate all the good things and focus on class half full. Um, which I think was a big turn for me in my career as a human, but also in my marketing. Thanks for sharing that. I, I love the the recommendation of um, you, the perfection, right? and it's hard. Marketing is hard for folks that, that strive to be perfect because marketing is not perfect and not everything will turn out. And right. um, being okay with that and moving on, I think is definitely like, a challenge and yeah. I think shapes every marketer out there. Um, thank you, Megan. That, that was great. I, I learned a lot from you. I think that um, the folks listening to this show are going to learn a lot uh, around like, what are you doing? That's more human, more fun. Like you're just having a lot of fun with this brand yeah. and it's, it's one where I think you can do that. Um, but there are so many other ones out there that just need to, just relax and be human yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and take and take videos with your phone and yeah. test some things out. And, and so I think there's a lot of cool things that we talked about that you're doing. Um, I'm excited that you doubled your team and I look forward to seeing how you grow and, and where else you, you guys are going to pop up. So thank you. Um, thank you for being on here. If anybody wants to reach Megan, she's on LinkedIn, Megan Hurley with a string of letters and numbers. So I will include the link in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> and to find out more about Farmer's Fridge, you can go to farmersfridge.com. Thank you for coming on here, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great.